Uh, moving on. Sorry, let me take a quick drink here because I'm parched. Ah, there we go. Next question is from uh, Iruk, who I've seen, uh, who I'm a, a subscriber of. Let me try that again. Whom I am a subscriber of, and I've seen uh, around V's channel and do in his streams and stuff like that. So he's uh, Iruk. If it's if it is a male, I think it is. Uh, pretty well known in the LPing circle, I think. Uh, he says, Congrats on 1,000 subs, Pem. You deserve no less. Thanks. My question. If you were the first human to set foot on Mars, what would your historical first words be? This is a good question. I thought a long time about this one, and I could not come up with anything good. Um, I think somebody else would have to write it for me. And it makes me wonder if Neil Armstrong, did he write one small step for man line or did somebody else write it for him and he took it up there because that's a good that's a great line like it's a perfect line but I'd, I'd be very pressed to come up with something similar for mars and you know if the first person who does step on mars assuming we get there uh would would armstrong would be their benchmark that they'd have to at least say something as good as armstrong i think that'd be their goal you know mars is at least as big of a step as as the moon um, but yeah, I think I'd hire, I'd hire a writer, probably. A poet, maybe. Um, or, you know, just... I don't know, well, I, I wouldn't really do this, but I'd be tempted to, you know, get off the ladder, stop my boot in the dirt, ask it, ask Mars how it likes my size 11s or whatever, or, uh, like, shout, like, You're next, Europa! And, like, shake my fist at the heavens or something. That'd be kind of fun. That would, that would go over horribly, but... I'd probably be an internet legend. Um, next question. Cadmo Shippotter. That's a tough name. Cadmo Shippotter, I think. Cadmo Shippotter? Cadmo Shippotter. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to call you Cadmo for short. Says, Yay, Pem, congrats. Less than three. Uh, do you have a weird addiction? Will you start a new Skyrim series? Parenthetical, Anna and I at the same time. Yes, may I suggest a beggar with the Be a Beggar mod who is a sneak thief. If they let you... Oh, and then next question. If they let you, would you rather go out with Jennifer Lawrence or Selena Gomez? Uh, do I have a weird addic uh, addiction? For a long time when I was young, I chewed my nails, which is a gross habit. <coughs> Excuse me, and it took a long time to kick. <coughs> it was when I finally was working in a bar, I think in college, that I took a health and sanitation training class, and that got me to kick it right quick, man. Once you learn what the heck is going on with food preparation and germs and bathrooms and stuff, I kept my hands out of my mouth for the rest of my life after that. Um, also, uh, I've always had sinus problems as a kid especially, but um, get sinus infections kind of regularly. You always get colds and stuffy noses, so occasionally I'm, I'll find myself using nasal spray to clear that up and nasal spray is a really addictive drug uh, and I, I try to stop after three days use but sometimes I end up at seven or eight days use if I can't clear it up and then I find that I can't breathe even though I'm actually over it when I'm not using it and it's like oh okay it's time to quit this so I guess I've had an occasional addiction to nasal spray that's not that weird I guess but no otherwise I, I'm fairly independent of addiction which is good uh, I'm fortunate in that regard I don't think it's something special about me uh, regarding a Skyrim series concurrent with a Nike, no, I will not do that because that would just be Skyrim overkill. Um, I said that I'd play an average of about an hour of video games a day, and lately that's been mostly Skyrim. But doing an LP, actually, I'd say for every 20 minutes or so of footage that I upload, there's probably an hour of work that goes into it. You know, 20 minutes to record it, uh, another... 20 minutes or so to review it and edit it, and then some time to upload it, to upload it and review it some more, and get it, you know, get the lighting just right, and the, the sound volume just right, and, you know, it's become kind of routinized now that I've done it for a while, so it's not quite as much work as it used to be, but uh, still, there's a lot of background work that goes into LPing, uh, so, yeah, running, running more than one Skyrim LP would probably just burn me out. Um, I do have plans to do another Skyrim LP sometime in the future, but it's going to be way, way in the future, like 
there will be like uh, maybe eight or ten LPs between now and then. So don't uh, hold your breath, I guess. Because I just I need time. You know, you play a game for a while, you got to step back, come back to it later when your mind is fresh again. You can't play it for nonstop for the rest of your life. You know. Um, let's see. Oh, your suggestion about uh, the character that I would play, though, that's a good suggestion. Um, I won't take it, but uh, I like the suggestion. Um, and I would say to you, Cadmo, why why not try to do it yourself? Why not, uh, I mean, assuming that you, you know, have the uh, ability to do so, uh, I encourage you to uh, try LPing yourself if you'd like. It's once you Once you get everything set up, it's not as difficult as you might think. Or at least, I, I think it is. Maybe other LPers would disagree, but... Um, yeah, you should give it a shot if you'd like. Uh, if they let you, would you rather go out with Jennifer Lawrence or Selena Gomez? Well, that's a weird question, because you have to understand. Those women are, each of them, about a decade younger than me. And at my age, uh, that's like a third of my life, a decade. So, it's a little less than a third, but... Um, that's a kind of a so that's still kind of creepy. Like a, a 32 year old man, man dating a 22 year old woman. That's weird. Like a 52 year old man dating a 42 year old woman. That's not weird. But 32, 22. That's weird. Uh, so I would say neither because they're just too young. But that said, Jennifer Lawrence is a total babe. Uh, Harry King says, "Congrats on 1,000 subs." Just remember, subs aren't everyone who watches. I spent a long time watching videos, not yours, but other people's a while ago, on a regular basis without subscribing. Partly due to the fact that I couldn't remember my login for YouTube. Anyway, keep it up. I just wish I had more time in my day to be watching videos. And then later he commented another comment. Right, I've got a spare five minutes now between work and sleeping, so here's my question. Hope I'm not too late. Sorry if it's been asked. I don't really have time to check them all. Anyway. What type of car vehicle do you drive? Car slash vehicle do you drive? If you do drive. Um, sort of in between. My family does own a vehicle, uh, but I am not the primary driver. Uh, my girlfriend is the primary driver. Um, we own a 2013 Toyota Corolla. And we've actually owned, we've owned Toyota since 2007. Uh, we had a Toyota Corolla in 2007. We were on a three-year lease. We... Uh, re-upped with them in 2010 and then we re-upped with them again in 2013 so this is actually our third Corolla it's a fantastic car, it's small uh, it's light get good gas mileage, it fits our family just fine um, the only detriment to the Corolla for us is that it's a little tight when we, ha when we go on trips if we go to visit family, like road trips and things like that trying to pack four of us in the car and uh, luggage and things we'll use while we're gone is pretty tight uh, but that said, you know, given that that's such a small percentage of the, the use that we get out of it, I, I'm totally fine with it. Corolla is a great car. Um, but no, I don't drive very much. Uh, I take public transportation to and from work. So the only time that I drive is like on the weekends I'm going to the store or I'll take the boys to swimming lessons sometimes or uh, that kind of thing. I miss it. I miss not, I miss driving. You know, when I was growing up, I drove quite a bit. Uh, well, once I was obviously of age. High school and college I drove quite a bit, but uh, since living in Chicago, it kind of weans you off a car, uh, and I, I haven't gone back to it yet. We would probably have to get a second car at some point now that we live in the Twin Cities. It's a little bit more difficult to get around by public transportation. It's worked out so far for us, but I'm imagining that something someday in the next year, probably, if we're able to afford it, we'll have to... Uh, budget for a second car, which I'm not looking forward to, but, eh, whatever, can't be helped, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> next, some random adventurer says, congrats, Pem, I love your content, and I'm very glad to have helped you along in my own small way to reaching this important subscriber milestone, thanks. My questions are, one, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, what's your favorite genre of music? Two, what is the first role-playing game you ever played? can be tabletop or video game, whichever was first. Three, do you like sweets? If so, what is your favorite sugary treat? If not, are you even human? Uh, I'll take these one at a time. What kind of music do I listen to? I will listen to just about anything. I'm not that picky. Although there are two genres that I try to avoid, 
I don't really enjoy heavy metal, and I do not enjoy modern country music. Uh, I like music with a melody, and so metal is kind of hard for me to hear. It just kind of seems... I don't know, it's kind of like just angry and scary, and it just doesn't... I know, I, I'm kind of, like I said, I'm kind of a wimp. I don't like scary games, I don't like scary movies, I don't like metal, like... It's wimpy. I know. I know, it's wimpy. I'm fine with that. Um, but I do like the bands that are considered, you know, the, the prototypes, or maybe the founders of metal. Like, I like Led Zeppelin, I like Black Sabbath, uh, I don't know, Deep Purple I thought was a pretty cool band. Like, uh, I, I like hard rock music, I just don't like... Rowley, angry. Just, just, yeah. It's got to have a melody, man. It's got to have some soul to it, I think, for me, personally. Um, regarding country, the reason I hate modern country is because it's not country anymore. It's not. Uh, I like country music. I like uh, Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and Patsy Cline and Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson. Those are some of my favorite country musicians. Um, but that's not what country music is anymore. It's it all it is now. Well, at least you know, radio country, I guess, is nothing but pop music, formulaic pop songs that have a twangy voice and an occasional pedal steel guitar. That's it. And they're just they're like they're. I'm sorry if you like modern country music. I, I don't mean to tear your likes apart, but man, I just can't tolerate it. It's just. I, uh, our washing machine broke down this past weekend, and I had to, I spent about three hours in the laundromat, and the laundromat was playing uh, country music nonstop, and it was, oh, it was my own private purgatory. It was like, what the fuck? This is terrible. Because it was all the songs sounded the same, just like pop music. That's not you know not saying that pop music doesn't, but that's what I mean. Is that country is just pop music now with a few changes. They all sounded the same, and then. Like, half the songs weren't about anything. Like, some of them were about heartbreak, or, you know, I'm leaving my man, or I'm leaving my cheating woman, which is what, you know, that's, that's old, that's old country, that's fine. But half of them were just songs that didn't even have a, st they were just, like, like rural right wing buzzwords, you know? I drive my tractor, uh, I love beer. Uh, you know, like, I wear a cowboy hat. Uh, the tallest building in my town is a water tower. Like, it's just like, uh, that's not, it's not a song, it's just a collection of jingo, like, I don't know. Eh, eh. I just don't like modern country. I hate it. Can't stand it. And I feel like, I don't know, but I feel like the country musicians that I do like, the older ones, would hate modern country music too. There are heirs to old country music. You know, there are, there are musicians today that play as if they're descended from those old country musicians, but it's not radio country, that's for sure. Um, favorite genre of music? I'd say probably blues or funk. I really like funk and blues. A lot of fun. Uh, blues is good because it just, it's, it, I don't know, it's a 1-4-5 chord progression over and over every song, most, most every song, but it... I love it. I can't get enough of it. It's great. A good blues song will always make me feel good. And um, funk is just a lot of fun. It's like great rhythms, good bass. I really like, I, I, I like, you know, James Brown especially, but also Parliament. Um, Funkadelic is really good. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, um, uh, early 90s actually, a band called Brand New Heavies uh, was a kind of a Neo funk band, I guess you call it, but they were they were also very good. I really enjoyed them too. Um, and then any any you know musicians that incorporate funk anyway, like uh, uh, there are actually some. My, my favorite blues musician is uh, Junior Wells. Uh, he's fantastic, and he would he. There's a I see I have a CD uh, album of his called Live at Teresa's, which was recorded in a little dive bar in Southside Chicago back in like the late '70s, I think. And it was recorded in the bar. Like it's, a, you know, you can hear the patrons in the back t background talking while he plays. But it's a great album. It's really rough. Like he, you know, he and his band. It's not 
this is not a stage show. This is not like a live, you know, they were just playing for some drunk patrons one night. Um, so there's, you know, there's some missed beats and some, you know, messed up chords and stuff like that. But in terms of the soul and the energy that went into that album, it's fantastic. Uh, and it's really funky too. Like he puts a lot of soul into that. Yeah, I keep saying the two same two words, funk and soul. But yeah, he puts a lot of heart into that performance. It's, it's a lot of fun to listen to. Um, let's see. Are we moving on? Oh no, sorry, I haven't finished all your questions. Uh, so I, yeah, my favorite genre, genre, blues or funk. Uh, what is your first role-playing game you ever played? Oh, and rock and roll. I mean, rock and roll, like rock and roll. Rock and roll will never die. Uh, what is the first role-playing game you ever played? Uh, does Diablo count? It's got RPG elements, but then the quests are very linear. There's there's not there's no choice involved. I don't think in Diablo, if I remember correctly. Uh, if Diablo counts, I'd say Diablo. If it doesn't count, then I'd probably say D and D when I was in college. Tabletop D and D. Um, do I like sweets? Yes, absolutely. My favorite sweet, uh, which you ask about, sugary treat, is one that I actually gave the recipe for in my 500 subscriber Q and A. I'll refer you to that. So it was. It's called uh, gooey butter cake. It's very popular in St. Louis where I grew up. Although from the comments that were in response to that video, I understand that it's popular in other areas of the country too. But yeah, if you want the recipe, listen to that uh, Q&A, the 500 subscriber Q&A, or uh, look it up online. I'm sure you can find it. It is fantastic, and it will make you very, very fat if you eat it. Uh, so just be careful. Uh, let's see. Oh, the next question is from Variax. Uh, it's, uh, he said, Grats on 1,000 subs, man. Well deserved. I won't be able to do it in this accent. I'm sorry. Uh, your countless deaths in your first dragon battle should be interspersed throughout the highlight reel, I feel. You know, I played a drinking game to that once, yeah? Drink every time you died? Well, I almost did. Anyway, my question. What's the closest you ever come to dying in real life? Uh, yes. The deaths in the fight against Mirmolnir is in the highlight reel now, and I know that Variax knows that because he commented on that video, so uh, I'm being redundant here. But uh, Regarding V's drinking game, in his charity stream, yes, I did hear about that. Uh, I was not... I, I actually... Uh, I don't know that I was on hand on, uh, during the actual stream. I witnessed part of the stream watching it later on his Twitch channel. I didn't get to the drinking game until... Uh, well, I didn't get to it at all, and I stopped watching, and I had to go do something else. And then it was a few days later that I heard about the drinking game, and I was like, oh, 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 I want to go check that out. But by the time I got to it, uh, the video had already been removed from Twitch, and because of some of the music that was playing in his stream, he didn't... Uh, Barry X didn't upload it to his Vstream channel, which is understandable, I don't blame him for that. Uh, but as a result, I never got to see the uh, drinking game, which is kind of a shame, but uh, but I do have a plan for vengeance. Um, I won't tell you what it is, and I don't know when it'll be enacted, but someday I will make a drinking game out of a very X video or two. And then we'll see who's laughing or puking. Um, let's see. Closest I ever came to dying in real life. I thought about this for a while, and I, I, I want to say that there's another time that is closer, but I can't think of it. So the time that I'm going to tell you is, um, I was dating a girl who lives in Spokane, Washington, uh, Washington State, here in the United States, and I went out to visit her one time, and we were, uh, we, for, I, I went out there for maybe five days or so. And we went on a hike one day into the, uh, there was some, there was a state park or some, you know, public, public property set aside, preserve or something like that, um, in the mountains near Spokane, I think, so that maybe these the Sierras, somebody who lives out there can correct me, um, and, uh, we were climbing up the side, we were going for a hike, we took, I think we took a picnic lunch maybe, and we were climbing up the side of a, it was a hillside, but I mean, it was climbing up the side of a mountain. But it wasn't, you know, don't think don't think Mount Everest or something like that. We were just taking a, a hike up a nature trail, basically up the side of this mountain. Well, we're kind of whiting out here in Cyrodiil. Strange weather. Um, climbing up the side of this hill, and and my the girl I was dating at the time was climbing the hill in front of me, and she I was maybe 10, 15 yards behind her, so there's a pretty decent 
this decent distance between us. She had stepped up on top of a rock that was kind of like half in the ground, half out of the ground. And it was about the size of like a love seat, maybe like a two person couch. And when she stepped off of it onto the ground above that rock, uh, her weight shift was enough to dislodge the rock and actually push it down the hill. And it came right at me. And I, I, I didn't, you know, it split second. I didn't even have time to think. I just, my, my body just jumped itself out of the way. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't have to move far, maybe three or four feet to one side. I mean, I, ju- I mean, jumped. I like, I left my feet getting out of the way of it. Um, and it rolled down the hill and like broke through a couple trees and I don't know how long it rolled, but we could hear it rolling much, much longer than we actually saw it roll. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I could maybe, I don't know what the tonnage of that kind of, uh, that size rock would be, but it was big and it was loud. And, uh, if I hadn't gotten out, of the, gotten out of the way, maybe it wouldn't have killed me, but it would have definitely ruined my day. I can tell you that. Um, so I think that's probably the closest I ever came to dying that I can re- think of. And you would think if I'd come closer, I'd probably remember it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's, that's got to be it. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I need another drink. Excuse me. I'm drinking wine this time, too. Although this time it's French wine. <laughs> yes. The French. Um... Next question is from Tim Gerbel. It's Tim, and then it's spelled G O E B E L. So I'm wondering if that's Goebel, like that's how he pronounces it, or if it's supposed to be the German, like Goebel. Like I imagine that his name was Goebel. It's not Goebbels, but uh, I don't know. Tim, tell, let me know how you pronounce your name if you if you uh, respond to this, if you listen, to, uh, watch this video. Uh, <clears throat> Tim says, "Way to go! Congrats! Con- oh, let me try that again. Way to go! Congrats on 1,000 subscribers. Salute." Question: What was your childhood slash youth like growing up? Family, school, groups, uh, interests, hobbies, influences, good or bad, etc. What made Pam the man? Well, manish. Uh, how about person that you are today? Thanks. Uh, my childhood. Uh, well, okay, so I, I mentioned I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I lived there from birth until I was 18. And then I lived for a short time in a town called Springfield, Missouri, which is where currently known as Missouri State University is. At the time I went there, it was called Southwest Missouri State. Went there for my freshman year of college. So I lived in Springfield for one year. And then I moved from there to Chicago, Illinois, and uh, finished my education there at Maybe I'm giving too much information here, actually telling you what schools I went to. Ah, too late. Uh, Finished my education at Loyola University in Chicago. Graduated in 2004. So I moved to Chicago in 2000 and lived there in 2013. Oh, yeah, just this year. Yeah, I moved to uh, the Twin Cities just this year. Uh, But anyway, growing up, uh, we grew up in... It's it's Jefferson County, uh, most of you probably aren't familiar with St. Louis or its environs, but uh, Jefferson County is the exurbs of St. Louis. It's just past the end of the suburbs. It's kind of still sort of the suburbs because it's actually pretty easy to get to the city from there. You can get to St. Louis in about half an hour from Jefferson, from northern Jefferson County, which is where I lived. Let me clarify. Um, but Jefferson County is also a very poor county. A uh, lot of low-income people there, white, white, low-income people, um, and it actually, I, I don't know if it still is, but when I was in high school, Jefferson County was like the meth capital of the world, the largest, at that time, the largest meth bust in the history of the country happened about a mile down the road from where my dad lived, um, so it was, it, I, we were not, uh, below the poverty line, my family, but we were not middle class either. We were, we were, you know, upper lower class basically, uh, or maybe maybe lower lower middle class. Maybe we maybe we just crossed the threshold into middle class. I don't know. I doubt it. But um, so didn't have a lot of money to burn when we were growing up. Uh, we were on a tight budget usually. It was it was myself and two brothers. I'm the oldest. 
My two younger brothers are uh, one's three years younger than me, one's seven years younger than me. Um, and we got along pretty well. We, Because of where we lived, um, we didn't hang out too much with kids in our neighborhood because kids in our neighborhood tended to be really poor and kind of dirty and stinky. And I'm not trying to like badmouth low-income people. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that I, we thought we were better than them, but it was just kind of weird. Like, they were just kind of weird people. Like, they were, like, kind of gun-owning and owned ATVs and, um, like, one kid in our neighborhood owned a BB gun and shot himself in the eye with it. It was just, like, you just kind of want to avoid those kinds of people, you know? Like, eh, this, with, not to say that that's how low-income people are, uh, but this particular neighborhood of low-income people were like that, so <laughs> we avoided them mostly. Uh, my mom has a pretty big family. She has 10 brothers and sisters. I have about 22 cousins on that side of the family. So, uh, we, and, they, and most, most of the family still lives around St. Louis. Um, so in lieu of spending time with kids in our neighborhood, we actually spend a lot of time with our cousins. Uh, so like growing up, my best friend was one of my cousins. Um, two or three of my other friends were my cousins. Um, you know, I was my be I was the best man at my cousin's wedding when he got married a few years ago. So it was a pretty close knit uh, family group, even though you know some of them lived kind of far away. Uh, so yeah, my co my friends growing up were my cousins. I had I had friends in school too, of course, but uh, my my best friends were my cousins, which is maybe not atypical, but I don't think it's necessarily very normal. At least. Among the other friends, the friends that I've made since then um, do not have not usually spent the time with their cousins that I did when I was growing up. Uh, uh, so yeah, I was a pretty good student in school. I was usually, uh, I mean, I'm not one to speak of myself favorably most of the time, but I, I got pretty good grades in school. I scored pretty well on standardized tests. Um, I had a pretty easy time of it in school, and then actually had a really rough time when I ended up going to college because I think um, I had gotten used to being able to coast uh, in school and then when I got to college I realized like holy shit I have to put a lot of work in and then I was like oh well this is just too hard and I didn't when I moved to college I didn't have an adult there I didn't have my mom or my dad looking over my shoulder making sure that I was doing my homework I realized the only person policing me was me and I thought well pff, shit I don't have to do this stuff I don't want to do it so I didn't do it and it was bad so it took me five years to get through college uh, which when it should have taken me just four probably um uh but uh yeah it cost me some extra money too which i'm still paying off but yeah that's you know I, I would not have learned the lesson if i hadn't made the mistake people told me you know don't screw around when you're in college and it still took people gave me the advice it still took me actually doing it to learn the lesson though um Childhood, yes. Yeah, so, well, I guess another major influence when I was in childhood, uh, my dad uh, was in Boy Scouts when he was a kid. He earned his Eagle Scout, and then uh, when he had, of course, three sons, and he wanted to make sure that all three of us got our Eagle Scouts, so Boy Scouts was a big part of uh, my childhood from about... Well, I was a Cub Scout, which was kind of lame, and then I was a Boy Scout from the age of 11 till 18. Uh, and I worked uh, summer camp, Boy Scout summer camp, actually, from the age of 15 until... 19. I worked for five summers, which was a lot of fun and really formative period of my life, actually. I learned a lot about how to be an adult at summer camp. It was really useful. Uh, I have mixed feelings about the Boy Scout program now as an adult, uh, but as a teenager, it was really helpful to me. Not so much because of the Boy Scout program itself, but because of the people that I met while I was in Scouts uh, that I made friends with. My best friend, uh, today is somebody that I met working summer camp in St. Louis for the Boy Scouts, and uh, he has probably had the biggest influence on me outside of you know my own my own mother, I guess, uh, in terms of how I develop as a person and you know who I am as an adult and what I think is important and how I value things and and how I treat other people. Um, he he has done a lot actually to make me a better person. Uh, sorry to get sentimental and saccharine on you guys but uh yeah so so boy scouts it's kind of it's it's weird how it works out you know my dad pushed really hard for myself and my brothers to be in boy scouts and it ended up 
indirectly being one of the most formative things, you know. So my dad had a formative role on me, obviously, because he's my dad, but the biggest role that he played in my life was actually pushing me to do other things that gave me an even more formative experience, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, I don't want to go on about that too long. I think that's a pretty good answer to that question. Um, school. Yeah, I, I went to Catholic schools. Uh, I was raised Catholic. My mom's Catholic. My dad is a, is a non-denominational Protestant. He's kind of not even really Christian anymore. He's kind of a He's kind of a new agey deist now, which is kind of annoying, but eh, whatever. Um, my mom is still a Catholic, although she has gotten pissed off enough with the church in the last eight or so years uh, to stop going to church, which is a pretty big deal for her. Um, she's not talked about, you know, she still, you know, she still prays, I'm sure, and she still has Jesus magnets on her fridge and stuff like that, but, um, she's kind of fed up with the Catholic Church, which is totally understandable. I'm right there with her. Um, but yeah, I was raised Catholic. She made sure that myself and my brothers went to a Catholic grade school, Catholic middle school, Catholic, I went to a Catholic high school. Uh, my brothers both went to public school because by the time they got there, uh, we just, the family couldn't afford <laughs> Catholic high school tuition for all three of us, so uh, that got uh, skipped for them. But uh, and then, of course, I ended up going to Loyola in Chicago, which is a Jesuit school. So I, I was raised by Catholics, essentially, which probably explains my uh, need to suffer. But uh, we'll, we'll get into that another time. Uh, let's see. Late Moon Grass says, "Congratulations on your deserved milestone, Pem." As a reference to your last q and I'd like to inquire about your favorite Borges stories. Ah, yes, he's asking about Jorge Luis Borges, who I listed as one of my favorite writers in the 500 subscriber Q&A. Uh, you know, I have Borges collected fictions. I own it, which is, you know, that's my exposure to Borges, essentially. Uh, it's got literally hundreds of short stories in there, and I've read them all, and I enjoyed very, very many of them. But I, since I've moved to the Twin Cities, we had to pack all my books away, and we've got them in storage because we're currently living with my in-laws, future in-laws, I guess, uh, and we just don't have enough space to have all those books here. So Borges is packed away. So I couldn't, when you asked that question, I was like, oh, yeah, what are my favorite stories? But I couldn't refer to the book to actually get the titles of my favorite stories. So I apologize for that, Late Moongrass. I have to just give you the rundown as best as I can remember it of the stories that I like the most. Um... And maybe, maybe you could actually tell me the names of these uh, stories. One of them was, it's really short, it's like a one-page story. Um, and it's about, Borges is trying to give a proof of God, proof of the existence of God. And it's, I liked it because I have read other proofs, you know, I, I, I don't know. Religion is kind of a, a thing of mine that I like to read about and uh, study. Uh, I was an anthropology major in college. I mentioned that in the previous subscriber Q&A. Uh, and religion is a big part of anthropology and culture. And so it's always kind of interested me. Mythology has always interested me. Um, so anyway, so I, I, growing up being Catholic and everything, when I began to have doubts about Catholicism, about God, uh, not to get too much into that, at least not right now, uh, I would read about theologians who had attempted to prove the existence of God, because I was like, oh, if I could find a proof, well, there you go, that answers it, you know, right away. So I read about, like, Anselm's proof, which is disappointing, to say the least. Uh, and it, so anyway, any any proof that I read of, I was like, what? That's the best I can do? Like, that's crap. So anyway, when I read this Borges story, I was actually intrigued by it, because I was like, oh, he's going to try to prove the existence of God. And I ended up liking it, uh, not because he convinced me, I don't, I don't know if Borges did or did not believe in the existence of God. This story may have been, you know, kind of a projection of his. I don't know. Uh, but I ended up liking the story because it was clever, because it was actually the most clever attempt at a proof that I'd ever heard. And I'm going to get it wrong. I'm sorry, I'm going to get it wrong. But the gist of the story is, uh, he says, you know, um, close your eyes and imagine that a number of birds fly past your vision. Uh, a number less than ten. And then open your eyes and... God, I'm not, I'm not going to get it right. I'm sorry. You guys have to look up the story to be sure. But it, he talks about a, a hypothetical where you close your eyes and imagine a number of birds f 
rushing past your eyes, uh, flying past your vision, rather. And then you, you, you open your eyes. Can you tell him the number of birds that flew in your vision? Uh, and it has something to do with, you know, there's, it's, it's less than 10, but you, you didn't actually count them because they flew past so fast, so there's no concrete number. And if there's no concrete number um, between less than 10, but you know that it was a number less than 10, somehow he ends up with, therefore God exists. Ah, God, I wish I could do the story justice. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, Borges. Wherever you are, I'm, I apologize. I'm butchering your story, I'm sure, but it's, it's an excellent little thought experiment and i really enjoyed it it didn't like i said it didn't convince me i don't know if that was the goal of his story i I doubt it was but i think it was more just a clever little thing that he came up with but it was really really fun little story and uh late moon grass if you know the title of that story please do post it in the um comments of this video because i'd like the people who hear this if they're interested in it to be able to go find it somewhere because it's a really clever little story uh another uh, favorite borgia story of mine i think it's called the quixote I'm not positive. I think it's just called the Quixote. Um, but the premise of the story is Borges is talking about, I think, another writer that he knows, who I believe, I'm sure is probably fictional, but um, he says that the, the writer decides, he gets this bug in his brain that he's going to he's going to rewrite Don Quixote, you know, Miguel de Cervantes' uh, novel, one of the first, you know, Western novels ever written, Don Quixote. Uh, but he's not just going to rewrite it in the sense that you, you know, do an adaptation of it. He's actually, this, this writer is trying to do an experiment where he's going to live his life so that Don Quixote occurs to him naturally. Like, so that he sits down at his typewriter and writes Don Quixote as if he had lived his life so that Don Quixote came out of him as a natural artistic expression of how he had lived his like like so basically he's trying to like he's almost trying to like become a second cervantes i know that's again i'm not doing it justice but it's a really interesting idea uh instead of just trying to recreate a story trying to actually recreate the circumstances that led to the story i don't i, just, I really like the idea uh and I, I think i don't remember what happens to the writer in the end i can't remember if he goes mad or if he just kind of gives up on it but uh it's a really really cool little story and then I think the third one, I'd say, and this is probably actually my favorite, um, because at the time that I was reading Borges, I had read maybe half or three-fourths of the book, and I remember thinking, like, man, I've enjoyed every one of these stories. Borges is such a great writer. Like, I wish that I could have met the man, you know, because he, he died, I think, in the 80s? Uh, sorry, I probably, probably had that wrong, but he died, I think, in my lifetime. Um... Uh, and he was, he was an old man when he died. He was like 70 or 80 something years old. Um, so it's not like I could have met him when I was, you know, five or six years old and actually had a conversation with him. But I remember thinking after reading these stories, I'm like, man, he's, he's such a good writer and he has such great ideas. And he kind of thinks about things the same way that I like to think about things. Like, I really wish I could meet this person. And so I remember thinking that, like, I think I read the book one day on the, on the train on the way to work. And then I was thinking that, you know, so I enjoyed the book, the stories. And then I was thinking that while I was at work, I was like, man, I wish I could have met the man. And I had these thoughts. And then I was reading it again a few days later, reading Borges again. And the short story that I read was kind of a little essay of his on his relationship to his readers and thinking like how he would never get to meet most of his readers and how he wonders if his readers will really truly know the real him or if they'll just know this kind of pastiche of like Borges type qualities that they kind of put together in their mind based on what he's written and it was like it was like a revelation to me it was like holy shit like not only do I wish that I could meet this guy and I wonder if I actually know who the real Borges is but he is writing these stories and wondering if he wonder wondering if his readers know who the real Borges is it's I, I don't know the title of the story again but it was it was it was like an amazing little revelation while I'm reading this on the train because it was like, holy shit, this guy thought the exact same thought that I did. He thought the exact same thought that I did and he wrote a story about it and put it in this book and then I read the story after I had the thought. Like It was such a weird little coincidence. I was like, wow, man, Porges is brilliant. Uh, so yeah, I would, I'd say those three are probably my favorite. Uh, and again, I'm sorry I can't provide you guys the titles. I wish I could. 
I will rely on Late Moon Grass to uh, help me out if he can. Uh, the next comment is from Liam O'Broin, uh, who says, Congratulations, long life to you and your YouTube channel. Keep up the good work. My question is, apart from role-playing video games as your source of employment, what is the best job you ever had? Uh, and I would say, what I referred to earlier, actually, working uh, summer camp for the Boy Scouts. Pay was crap. Hours were long. Work was hard. Temperature was hot. Humidity was high. Um... Demands were high, but it was a great experience. I had a lot of fun. I met a lot of fun people, made a lot of friends, and it was, again, in a really formative period of my life that, that influenced a lot of the person that I am today. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that's the best job I've ever had. And, by the way, role-playing video games is not a source of employment for me. <laughs> I'm not making a dime off this stuff. This is all pro bono. Uh, so that said, I'm going to turn the rest... Uh, well, not the rest, a segment of this... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Q&A session over here and you guys will meet me on the other side of it if you will excuse me for just a moment. 